And today is Christ the King Sunday, and Jesus, that's my King. Um, and and it, this ends a church year. Today is the end of a year for us. As we begin next week, we start with the season of Advent. And, and Advent is a time of preparing uh, for the first coming of Jesus Christ. And so what we do as a way to prepare for the first coming of Jesus Christ is we take a look at the second coming of Jesus Christ and that his return will be in great power and in ultimate victory in a way that will leave no doubt that Jesus Christ is the king of the universe. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the very beginning um, of the book of Revelation, uh, which means apocalypse. And apocalypse is a word that we find to be scary. Um, but, but the reality is an apocalypse simply means um, unveiling. It's not about zombies. It's not about the walking dead. It's not about awful, terrible destruction. Wow, sorry. Um, I didn't mean to scare you with the word apocalypse. Um, but it's not, it's not intended to be scary. It's just an, an unveiling as Christ reveals himself in fullness at the end of time. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this opportunity to spend some time with you and with each other in your word. And God, we pray that you would come alongside of us and help us hear exactly what you need us to hear, regardless of the words that come out of my mouth, and, and help each person know that you love them and care about them in deep and abiding ways. Help me now get out of the way so you can come and truly be the way, the truth, and the life in the lives of those who are gathered here on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. What the book of Revelation declares is that the truth of Jesus Christ will become so abundantly clear one day that it's completely unveiled and everyone will see that truth. And the book of Revelation is less interested in the specifics of what the future look like, about all the this precise details <clears throat> of how the end of time is going to come. And it's far more interested in helping us be absolutely clear and certain about who holds our future. And that one day, one day, we will be redeemed by God and made right. And that helps us here and now today to believe and trust in that truth. Um, on May 27, 1986, I had an apocalypse. I had an unveiling moment in my life. I was 24 years old. I had um, done extensive paperwork. I had had psychological interviews. I had, I had had interviews about my theology from the Board of Ordain Ministry over a period of four years in the Florida Conference, and I had been approved as a candidate of ministry, and now I was going to be ordained. And um, I just graduated from seminary. Um, I'd, I'd gotten my first robe, and when you show up to that service, you don't wear a stole yet, You just because they're going to give you one, and it's a symbol of, of being yoked to Christ and a symbol of servanthood. Um, and, um, and so they give you that in that moment. Um, and all of us were gathered there that day that were being um, ordained in the first stage of the process. And we knelt down at an altar, and, and there was going to be a bishop who came and laid his hands on our head along with some other people, and, and he would pray for us. And the person who was our bishop was a guy named uh, Earl G. Hunt, who was about six foot four and 270 pounds. And he had this wonderful habit of leaning the fullness of his weight into you when he put his hand on your head. He wanted you to feel the weight of the moment that you were engaged in. And he leaned in really hard. I mean, I think, I don't know if he did it for you, but I felt like he was leaning. I looked down. It's like, he looks like he's leaning extra hard into me for some reason. And he said, Jamie Ray Westlake, take thou authority as a pastor in the United Methodist Church to preach the word of God and to serve all of God's people. And that was a moment of apocalypse, a revelation, an unveiling. I felt the full weight of the commitment that I was making to serve as a pastor. And I knew in that moment how complicated my future would be. Why? Because I didn't know what I didn't know. And I didn't know what I was really getting into, but I trusted that God would be with me. And the first prayer that I prayed after the bishop removed his hands from my head and, and I officially became a pastor was, oh my God, what have I done? Um, that, was, that was an apocalypse. 
Now, the book of Revelation is all about encouraging us to feel the full weight of the commitment that we make to love and serve Jesus Christ because it's not always going to be easy. We live in a world that won't value the commitment that we make to Jesus Christ and that will, will in fact, um, at times, the world will disappoint us and they'll even hurt us because of our commitment to Jesus Christ. And Revelation declares that here and now, the facts about our future speak into our present troubles and difficulties. And that's what the author, John, wanted to communicate to us. He had been exiled by government authorities to the island of Patmos because he refused to stop preaching and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and that people are saved through him alone. See, it was radical. It was crazy. You know, it's like if you declared that Jesus Christ is Lord, that means that no one else could be. No one else or nothing else could actually be the Lord of your life. And as in Rome, you were required to say Caesar is Lord. And of course, the Christ followers couldn't do that. Um, so it, it radically changed their sense of, of, yes, there's an earthly power, but Jesus is my king. He's the one to who, whom I owe worship. And uh, Domitian was the emperor, and he was threatened by this small little ragtag group of followers of Jesus uh, and their, their unwillingness to declare Caesar as Lord. And so he speaks into their lives, and he says to, to seven different churches, and churches all over the place, because it's a letter to, in general as well, and, and he's basically saying, um, uh, no, no matter how much earthly power anyone has, Never forget that our God has the ultimate power. And don't, don't push that aside. Don't fear for your future. Not, not that there isn't anything to be afraid of. They were going through all kinds of difficult times, and they were preparing for an even greater sense of persecution. Here's the word of God for the people of God. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. This is the revelation, the apocalypse, the unveiling from Jesus Christ which God gave, gave him to show his servants events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation uh, to his servant John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. Okay, so... so um, for 2,000 years, the church has been proclaiming that Jesus Christ is coming back when? Soon. Guess what? It's still happening soon. Now, 2,000 years may seem like a long time to us, but it's a snap of the fingers to God. So it's still, we always live in this anticipation moment of the, of, of the, the yes, this is real. It's just not here yet, but it's on the way kind of reality for us. <clears throat> um, it says, this letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. That is, it's a specific word to specific play, people in specific places in specific circumstance at a specific time. Okay, That's where it starts. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. Right? So he encapsulates, Jesus Christ is the Lord of our past, the Lord of our present, and the Lord of our future. And we must never forget that. Hugely important. Grace and peace to the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come from the sevenfold spirit before his throne. From Jesus Christ. He is, faithful, he is a faithful witness to these things. The first to rise from the dead and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by the shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father, all glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds in heaven, uh, and, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. And so there in the book of Revelation, uh, John, John wants to carry that first generation of Christ followers who are facing all kinds of persecution and every subsequent generation, including us, up to, a, up to a higher mountain peak to give us a long view of human history from a new horizon. Um, in the midst 
uh, of how bad things can be. And one thing that I love about Scripture is it never, de- it never uh, distracts or tries to take away from, from yes, it, it really is this bad. Sometimes um, what we're facing is, is dire and difficult and wildly painful. And it doesn't just say, you, oh, it just seems like you're suffering. Your suffering is not real. The Bible says, no, your suffering is difficult and real. But that's why hope, not a wish, hope is the assurance of things to come, um, will always be our rallying cry. Christ is, Christ was, uh, and will be the victory over sin, suffering, and death completely one day. That's why we we cling to hope. Now, I can imagine uh, John, as he's on the Isle of Patmos, um, I can picture him kind of up at the top of a range of mountains that are there. Here's the Patmos. He's up at the top of that range. He's looking out at the vastness of the sea, and he's remembering that Domitian, the emperor of Rome, has the power to exile him to this land. But he doesn't have the power to determine what he thinks and how he serves his his Lord Jesus Christ. And he remembers in this moment that, yes, uh, he has some earthly power over me, but Jesus Christ is my king, And I'm going to share him no matter what it takes. I'm going to honor the one who has has given me life, the king of the universe. And um, and he recognizes all earthly kings are limited. um, And all earthly powers, like, like sin, suffering, and death, they are limited too. They threaten to damage our soul, but we remember the reality that God is at work here and now and there and then. Anything with the potential to to powerfully threaten the rightful place of Jesus as the king, our king and the king of the universe, um, we just can't allow that to have power over us. Um, On December um, 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked, and the United States entered into World War II. Um, And the the prime minister of Great Britain, uh, Winston Churchill, Um, said something really profound on that day. He was appalled by the attack, um, but he knew immediately that the war was now won. Um, He said, being saturated and satiated with emotion and sensation, I went to bed and slept the sleep of the saved and the thankful. Now, what did he mean by that? And why did he say it? Well, he knew that the United States entry into the war was the assurance of victory. Oh, now to be sure. There were tons of battles left to fight, right? And there was much sin, suffering, and death for everyone to experience on every side of that horrible, awful um, war. 400,000 plus Americans lost their lives. 80 million people around the world were killed in World War II. But I think this gives us a picture of what it is that, that John on the Isle of Patmos is telling us that God is going to do in the Revelation, in the apocalypse, as the people of God suffer and have trouble. See, the victory is already won, but there are so many battles left yet to fight. And we, we not only know the king, but the king loves us. We not only know the king, but we love the king back. And our king promises to be with us through every trial, through every loss, through every fear, through the best of times and through the worst of times in our lives. And we know that our ultimate future has already been won, and that helps us redeem our past and deal with the present that is filled with complexity and difficulty and ambiguity and uncertainty, or even worse, when things really are as bad as we think they are. And Revelation invites us to reframe our present trouble and put it in the context of the future victory in Jesus Christ. So we remember and celebrate the future victory here and now. Um, Here's, here's I I like visuals sometimes, and I think this is kind of a helpful way for us to consider it. See, the future speaks into both the past and the present. Um, That we have future victory reminds us that, uh, that our past is redeemed. And we can't have a better future but we can know the one who wants us to have a better future. The future uh, victory reminds us that whatever we're going through in the present, it literally is not the end of the world. 
Um, it is simply um, our way of remembering that God is present with us through whatever it is that we're facing. And guess what? The present speaks into the future and the past speaks into the future. And the reality is God is the Lord. Jesus Christ is the Lord of my past, my present, and my future. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all of the past, the present, and the future. God is in charge of every tense that, that we can place before him. And that's an important way for us to remember. Grace and pre peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. And sometimes um, I'm asked, is Revelation a book about the, the past, the present, or the future? And I say, yes, that is correct. It's about all three tenses. God's in charge of each of them through the victory that is won in the future. Paul addressed this um, throughout his ministry as well. And we see it in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 4, verses 8 through 9, as he's describing um, what it is that he's faced in his ministry and mission. He says, We are pressed on every side by trouble, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. And sometimes, folks, life comes at us so fast and so furious that it feels like we're, we're drug, juggling flaming chainsaws, right? Um, and here's the thing. In God's Word, we see that God doesn't always even get His own way. I mean, think about that. Um, not until the end of time does God finally get God's own complete way because there's a lot of battles left to fight, but the victory has already been won. And then I love, I love what John tells them in this moment in verse 6. He says, He, God, has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. And as ones who, who share in the final victory of Christ one day, here and now, this is who we are. This is our life together. We are, we are priests. And what do priests do? Priests are ones who mediate the very presence of God. Priests are ones who look at the hurt and brokenness that fills this world, and we say, I I'm going to help. I'm going to help make a difference in the midst of all that great need that I see. And when we join Jesus in praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're crying out for God's final victory, and we're asking God to help us right here, right now, bring more of how God does things in heaven to the way uh, we get to do them on this earth. We want to help starting to set things right here and now. But we also see all too clearly throughout history, by picking up the newspaper, by looking um, at the news on TV, we know, we know all too clearly um, the reality that we face in crying out to God, that there are all kinds of ways that, that uh, we are not doing things on earth the way that God does them in heaven. And we're missing the mark of his full intention for our lives. But one day, one day we declare God is going to put everything right. Um, and that is, is huge and important. Now, in the meantime, as a sign of our ultimate victory with Christ in eternity, we are his kingdom of priests who mediate the presence of God. And even though there is yet much sin, suffering, and death for us to be defeated, to be defeated in our lives, we are already belonging to the world, understanding the rule of our kingdom. We are, we are trusting that God's kingdom is in line and in rule in our lives. Now, knowing our ultimate victory doesn't leave us feeling smug um, or self-satisfied. Um, instead, it means that we want to help as many people as possible experience the moment when Christ returns with great joy. Did you catch that in verse 7 when it says, it says, look, he comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. John is letting us know that one day, even those who signed Jesus' death decree even Pilate, who washed his hands of the whole thing, the guard who whipped Jesus, the crowds who, who mocked and spit on Jesus, the person assigned to hammer in the nails into his feet and his hands of the Savior of our Lord, the, and all the people 
Whoever denied Jesus throughout history will see him for who he really is as the king of the universe. And in that moment, they'll know the truth about our king. And our certain hope for the future is not about our self-vindication and being able to go, na 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 you missed it. That's not it. That's not the point. But it's about helping as many people as possible join in the celebration of Jesus here and now so that they, they'll be able to experience it with joy there and then at the end of time. I want to tell you about um, a couple of people in our church, Jamie and Annette Osborne. Um, 58 years old. They were both in, um, in ICU this past week on Wednesday um, on different floors. Um, one of the beautiful things that the staff did was bring them together um, so that they could, they could spend some time together. But Jamie um, has had um, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, for the last four years. And um, it's been a very difficult journey, and that's been by his side the whole four years. And one of the things that, that I love so much about Jamie is that in the midst of all that he was facing, as his body betrayed him, he, he still had a smile on his face, and he always had something to say about gratitude and about what he was thankful for. Um, and, um, and I said, they fought the good fight together. And um, Jamie was uh, not scared about death, but he was concerned about the process of dying, and that's completely understandable. Um, last month, um, three years and 11 months into the journey, Annette was diagnosed with a terminal illness as well. And um, um, so they were found themselves there in the hospital. Um, Jamie's uh, breath was shallow and he was intubated. And um, it was hard to, hard for, he couldn't really talk, um, he could, but he was very alert, very aware. And, and I visited Annette first and, and shared with her some of the things. And we talked a little bit about all that was going on. And um, we talked about how, how it was like that it looked like Jamie was going to beat her to the finish line, but not by much, um, which was such a shock, such a surprise. Um, no one really expected this reality. Um, and... And the ironic thing is, is we were both wrong. Uh, Annette died on Thanksgiving Day. Jamie was taken um, to hospice care, and he died the following day. He died on Friday. Um, and when I was sitting with Jamie on Wednesday, I mean, I, I read to him a number of scriptures. I read to him um, Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. I read from Romans chapter 8, which declares nothing, nothing in all this earth can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And I read from, from Revelation 21, John's vision of the new heaven and the new earth and what we have to look forward to. And he said, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. Oh, that's my king. He will live with them. And they will be his people. God himself will be with them. Jesus, that's my king. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. That's my king. And I sit and the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. That's my king. That's your king. That's our king together. That's what we're anticipating in the future reality and that we celebrate that final victory and we do it here and now as we get ready to anticipate the first coming of Jesus Christ at Christmas time. Think about it. Every wrong is going to be set right. Every illness is going to be healed. Every injustice is going to be corrected. Every sorrow will be redeemed in joy. Every tear will be wiped away and the power of death will be wiped away. That's my king. That's your king. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you that we have a strong and powerful king who will come back in ultimate victory. 
Here and now, um, we still suffer and struggle and, and wonder. We, we have our worries. We have our fears. Um, we have our weaknesses. We have sin, suffering, and death. And in the midst of that, Lord, we allow your future to speak into our present and to remind us that our past has been redeemed. And for that, we're abundantly grateful. And we thank you for Jesus. That's my King. Amen.